welcome back to another new week of Math 236 at Home Edition. Our topic for the beginning part of this week is section 11.3, which is also called the integral test. We'll figure out what that is in a little bit. Um, but let's just recall real quick before we get started um, what we had before. What did we do last week? We introduced the idea of an infinite series, right? Uh, we have a sum of infinitely many terms. We're adding up infinitely many things. 3 p.m. What does that mean? That means we are um, taking a limit as n goes to infinity of adding up finitely many things, right? So this is only adding up n things, that's finitely many. And then we're going to take a limit as n goes to infinity of that. Okay, so that's what we mean by adding up infinitely many things. It has a construct associated with it. Our favorite guy, the limit. This is just clunky notation, so we give it a new letter. S sub n is the nth partial sum, which is just adding up the first n terms of the series. And uh, we take the limit of this guy, and if that limit exists, we have some single finite real number as the limit, um, then we say that that series converges, okay? And it converges to us, to s. We've summed the series. Otherwise, if this limit doesn't exist, then the series diverges, right? That's what we've been talking about. And last week, what did we do? We did the divergence test, which is a test for what? Divergence only, right? Um, we did telescoping and geometric series, which we could determine um, convergence and divergence. And in those contexts, we could actually find that number s. We could actually sum the series, okay? But there aren't so many series for which that's um, easily possible at this stage of the game. And so this week and beyond, what we're actually going to be doing for, a next, uh, for quite a while is developing new tests for when, you know, that when these tests don't give us any information, um, new tests for whether a series converges or diverges. And we're going to stop asking, as we said before, we're going to stop asking for what the actual sum is. Because uh, we're not really going to be able to sum the series, but just determine whether or not it converges or diverges. We'll also then, since we can't actually sum it, we'll be interested in trying to bound how much error there is in approximating the sum. Now, how would you approximate the sum? You could add up the first n terms, right? That would be an approximation. You've left off infinitely many terms, so how do we bound how much error there would be? So that's one of, another important question. You ready? I hope you had a great weekend, and here we go. Okay, so let's go back to our familiar friend, right, um, and talk a little bit about the one series that we've been kind of bringing along for several lectures and, and trying to figure out what um, some of these things might tell us about it. So let's write down that particular series. So that series, um, remember, was the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 3n. We've just been bringing that guy along for a while. Okay, now, remember what is this guy? When n is 1, I've got 1 third, and then I add, and then when n is 2, it's 1 sixth plus 1 ninth plus 1 twelfth plus on and on and on forever, right? Okay? And, you know, by now, hopefully you've made some guess about whether or not you think that adding 1 third plus 1 sixth plus 1 ninth plus 1 twelfth plus 1 fifteenth, right, plus 1 eighteenth, on and on and on forever, whether or not that will actually sum to something finite, sum s, or whether that will diverge some to something infinite, right? Grow, grow large without bound. Okay, so what do we know? Did the divergence test help us with this? Absolutely not, right? The limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n, the nth term, the limit is zero. When we have zero from the divergence test, it tells us nothing, right? So the divergence test tells us nothing, okay? So now I'll make my, this will be nice, I'll just be able to uh, so if we're up here, right, divergence test tells us nothing, 
right? Because the limit of the nth term goes to zero. Um, it's not a telescoping series. So if we ask that as a telescoping, no, right? It's already written as a fraction, right? You're not going to be able to break that with partial fraction decomposition. Um, you're, 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 you're stuck with that. You're not going to get some subtracting thing that's going to collapse on itself. Is it geometric? No, right? Remember what geometric looks like. What does it look like? Good. R to the N, right? That's not R to the N, yeah? Okay. So it's not geometric, nothing that we have so far helps, right? So let's just start anew. Let's just start afresh with this guy, okay? Let's just draw a picture maybe. So here's an axis. Okay, then we'll let this be, um, the n axis, and then we'll graph a sub n right here, which is just our guy 1 over 3 times n, right? Okay. So what do we have then? Well, right, this guy only has, let's just look at a sub n, kind of like, like looking at a sequence, right? That's what we're doing. Um, and that's just going to keep on going, right? And what is a n when n is 1, it's 1 third, right? So I'm just going to make 1 third be up here just so it's bigger, right? It's that dot, right? My scale is obviously different on both axes. All right, and then what is a 2? It's 1 sixth. So that's that dot, right? And what is a 3? It's 1 ninth. That's that dot. A 4 is 1 twelfth. that dot, right? And um, and then they're just going to, right? 1 15th, 1 18th, you get it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Oops, that one looks bigger than this one. There we go. So those are our dots, right? That come from looking at just the terms in this sequence. And then what are we going to want to do? We're going to want to add them up. Yeah? Okay. All right. So let's think about that. What's another way to think about what's happening here? Well, this distance right here is one third, right? We're adding that number plus this distance right here is one sixth plus that number plus this distance right here is one ninth plus that number that puts one on up there plus this distance right here. Whoops. <laughs> 1 12th. 1 12th, right? Yeah? Okay. I'm going to stop putting them in there because I'm going to run out of space. So we're adding up these links the whole way. Is that sum going to sum to something finite or something infinite? Okay. Well, hopefully just by doing this, that ought to be making you think about a different part of this course, right? Um, that ought to hopefully be making you think about back when we were doing things like integration and read on sums maybe. And so let's go to this, uh, to a like continuous version of this problem. All right, so here we've got n as our uh, axes, but let's just think of it, what if we thought about x as a continuous variable now, and instead of a sub n, we also graphed on in green here on this um, vertical axis, uh, f of x, which would be, um, determined by a sub n, so I'm just going to replace it, the n with an x, 1 over 3x, right? 1 over 3x. What does 1 over 3x look like? You ought to know. Okay, good. Um, well, certainly it goes through each one of these points, right? And then we basically, my dots, well, we don't care about what's happening. Let's look at it on the integral from 1 to infinity. Okay. So that's a graph of our continuous function, f of x equals 1 over 3x, right? So this is f. Yeah? Alrighty now.
Well, that's kind of interesting. We like doing area under curves now, right? So let's just go off to the side and say, well, maybe I can't answer that problem. Instead, I'm just going to pretend I have some new problem, and I'm going to be like, okay, um, well, instead, instead, um, let's ask, what is the area under the graph of f on the interval 1 to infinity, right, for f of x equals 1 over 3x? Let's ask that question, okay? Are we good with that? Yay, we're excited. Okay, how do we, how do we talk about that? How do I turn these words into math? What do I say? What do I write? Right? What do I write? Area under a graph, that's an integral, right? What's my interval? 1 to infinity, right? Ooh, we recognize that is what type of integral? Good. Improper integral. Um, and what function is it? Well, it's 1 over 3x dx, right? So what is this integral? Now, hopefully you recognize this integral quite well, right? Um, in fact, so just to review, by means of review, what do we mean when we say we're going to integrate from 1 to infinity, right? We know we can't stick infinity into the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so this means, by definition, the limit as b goes to infinity, the integral from 1 to b of 1 over 3x dx. Yes, that's what it means. So now it's a question of, well, what do I do with this integral? All right, how do I deal with that guy? Well, hopefully you see this. Uh, you could do a u substitution, but why? Um, let's look at this a little bit nicer. 1 over 3x fraction mass. How can I rewrite that? Fraction mass? 1 third times 1 over x, yes? Woohoo! Then I don't have to deal with any u substitution changes or anything like that. This guy's a constant, right? Constants come along for the ride. Um, and so, what, whoops, that's a B. <laughs> Got a little crap carried away here. Um, and if, so, in fact, what do we have here, right? Um, this integral is itself one-third the integral from one to, which we could have written right up here, one-third the integral from one to infinity of one over x dx, right? Now, you, of course, know this integral, right? This guy is known to you by our work in section 7.8, which is improper integrals, right? We said back then that there were certain specific improper integrals that were gonna come up later that we're gonna to wanna to know those results that we proved um, for. So you should know what this integral does, whether it converges or diverges, and in fact, if it converges, whether it, what it would go to. Um, Right? We, uh, we derived all of that. So what's your instinct? Converge or diverge? Let's just show it just to make sure. Okay, so what do we do? Right, our one-third is going to come out here, right? It's a multiplying constant. I can pull it out of the integral. I can pull it out of the limit. So I got one-third limit as b goes to infinity of, um, I'll just write one more step, the integral from 1 to b of 1 over x dx, right? Okay, so what is? Still not doing anything with the limit. What is the um, integral of 1 over x dx? Good. Natural log of absolute value of x evaluated from 1 to b. Yes? Oh, Fantastic. So what happens when we have it here? We've got 1 third. And then we've got, when we evaluate uh, the limit as b goes to infinity of, I want that there, it's over here. The natural log of the absolute value of b minus the natural log of the absolute value of 1, right? Okay. Now, 1 is positive, so we could have gotten away without the absolute value here. b is also positive. b is growing large without bound, right? But still always good to put in your absolute values. All right, so what is the natural log of 1? Good. You guys know that that is identically equal to 0. It's something that you always know. And so we're left with one third limit as b goes infinity of natural log of b, right? What happens to the range of the natural log function as its domain grows positive without bound? Yeah, it goes off to 
bend a knee very, very, very slowly, right? Super slowly, um, but goes to infinity nonetheless, right? This guy does not exist, and therefore, what do we know about this integral? This integral diverges. You knew that, right? But it was good to just refer, re refresh your memory on where that came from back in 7.8. So that integral diverges, okay? The area trapped between the graph of one over x um, and the x-axis from one to forever grows infinite. We've already talked about how crazy that is. Okay, so, well, I just, we just changed the problem. We just made something else up, right? So what does that have to do with this thing we actually started with? That's kind of the deal, right? What does that tell us? Does it tell us anything? Can it tell us anything about our original problem, our series? So can the improper integral resolve? Tell us anything about our series? started with, we didn't know anything about this guy, right? Whether it sums to something finite, converges, or diverges. But we just saw that that integral diverges. Okay. Well, let's think about um, what we're going to do then for this problem. So we've already said, hey, wait a minute. Um, this kind of reminds us of this idea of when we were trying to you know, figure out the area under the graph, but if I colored that piece into green, and when we were doing Riemann sum approximations, right? So let's kind of get a look at what's actually happening here, right? So suppose we did a Riemann sum approximation, and let's look at this guy, right, with left endpoints, left hand sum endpoints, okay? So if I wanted to do that, and I wanted to use a delta x of 1, right, which is kind of already set up for us here, right? Delta x is 1, yeah, right? Distance between these guys, we've already chopped these integrals up, right? The distance is 1, yeah? Okay, so let's see. What is a left-hand sum approximation, right, then to our guy here? What is our left-hand sum approximation? Well, let's look at our first guy, okay? If we do a left-hand sum, we go to the left end point, and then we go to our height, and then we do our rectangle, right? So what is the area of this rectangle that we just drew there, right? The height is one, the width is delta x, which is one, right? Um, and the height is one-third, yeah? And then we're going to add our next left-hand sum. We go to the left end point. We draw our rectangle there, right? What is this height right here? That height was 1 sixth, right? What was the width of our rectangle, right? Length times width is we got 1 for our width and 1 sixth for our height, yeah? Let's draw the next one. Okay, what was this height right here? It was 1 ninth. What is this distance right there? It's 1, right? Plus 1 times 1 ninth, right? So what is the left-hand sum approximation going to be here, right? If we just continue this on sort of forever, um, we would have plus 1 times 1 twelfth, right? Da, 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 da. Yeah? Okay, well, it's nice that we have a delta x of 1, right? Because that's just the same as exactly our sum right there. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay? And so what do we know about this left-hand sum approximation? Well, as I'm drawing these rectangles, right, is this an overestimate or an underestimate for the area under my curve, right? There's the area under my curve. Am I getting too much? Yeah, so it's an overestimate, right? So the left-hand sum approximation, so the uh, area under f of x, right, on 1 to infinity is smaller than the left-hand sum approximation, right? Because 
this guy is an overestimate. And what did we say happened with the area under the curve? Well, it grew without bound. And if that is bigger than something that's grown without bound, is there any question what's happening? It's grown without bound, right? Okay. So we're then using that insight, this left-hand sum approximation is exactly my sum 1 over 3 to the n. Yeah? And the area under the curve grew without bound, and this is bigger than something that grows without bound, and therefore, what would be our conclusion about this particular series? Diverges, right? Because this guy grows without bound. Okay? Whoa. That's pretty nutty. That is pretty nutty, right? This thing, maybe that wasn't your first instinct. Kind of like that guy when we very first did it back at 7.8, right? But if I'm adding up these guys, that sum grows without bound, right? Okay, crazy. Now, until we actually develop why this connection works, um, we won't really have justified that this guy diverges, but we'll, we'll state the integral test and, and, uh, and we'll later prove it. But does this make sense? We get this idea? Okay, so let's keep going. Um, well, we finally now have some info on this series we've been dragging along for a while and maybe it's not the result you thought about and that ought to make you be like, oh wow, this is going to take um, some focused effort when I'm studying these series to make sure I don't make the common sense mistake, which would be like, well, obviously these numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, well, that's clearly got to add to something that's finite. But the answer is no. It adds to something infinite. Okay, so let's take another look. This was related to a pretty famous series we're going to talk about a little bit later in this lecture. Let's do another problem. Maybe a little bit faster this time. We were just trying to introduce the idea there. Um, this one's an example in your book too. Um, so I can even go faster. It's example. Um, I don't know. I didn't write down what examples. Okay, example from your book. I think it might even be example one. We'll see. Um, we're going to add sum n equals 1 to infinity sub 1 over n squared. Okay? Now again, same thing, right? Does the divergence test help you? No, right? The limit of this guy is zero. That tells you nothing. This is not uh, going to help. Telescoping is not going to help and neither is geometric. It's not geometric. Okay? So again, let's just weigh out what does this mean, right? It means 1 over 1 squared, so I got 1, right? I'll write it there, 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over 4 squared on and on and on forever, right? So it's 1 plus 1 fourth plus 1 ninth plus 1 sixteenth Plus on and on, on forever. Not too dissimilar from the problem we just did, right? It doesn't really look all that much different, right? So you might be tempted to guess, oh, they have the same behavior, right? But I know you wise calculus students are not thinking that now, right? So let's think about this guy. Um, again, visually, what are we doing here? If we just look at an axis, right? Um, again, with different scalings. So if this is 1, so I've got 1 at 1, 2 is 1 fourth, right? I have 3, I've got 1 ninth, yeah, and 4, it's 1 16th. That's about as 
much as I can do. Right, so I've got that same kind of d decrease in behavior. What am I doing with this sequence? Well, sorry, with this series, which is adding up, right, the sequence, a n is 1 over n squared, I, adding up those dots. Um, so, so again, remember, the sequence converges to 0, right? The series, we have no idea what happens. Um, and so we're adding up these guys, right? <laughs> these lengths. And the question is the same thing, right? Is the sum of all these lengths finite, right? This length right here is 1, this one's 1 fourth, this one's 1 ninth, this one's 1 sixteenth, right? That one's 1 25th, yeah? Okay, well, let's remember. What we did before, right? Okay, well, um, let's look at the integral, say, from 1 to infinity of the continuous version, maybe, of this problem. So a sub n, instead, if I have an f of x, Instead of an n, it's 1 over x squared, and if I think of x, right, which is a real number and not a natural number like n, then I've got an actual curve on 1 to infinity where I'm connecting these dots, right? Same deal. And then I can always ask the question, what is the area under this curve, right? Um, and so if we do the exact same thing, again, this should be a guy that you recognize and you immediately ought to know whether or not this converges or diverges. In fact, you ought to know what it converges to, right? That's a hint that it converges. Um, and, but let's just do it again just to make sure we all remember these ideas for improper integrals. So right now we're looking at the area under our green curve from 1 to infinity. And what does that mean, right? It means I'm looking at a limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to b of 1 over x squared dx. So how do I evaluate that limit? First, I have to do the integral. If I'm going to do the integral of 1 over x squared, how do I need to write, rewrite 1 over x squared? Good. x to the negative 2. Beautiful. Okay, and then I've got the limit as b goes to infinity of what? So what's the antiderivative or the easiest antiderivative of x to the negative 2? Add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, right? Power rule. Okay, and then we do what? Evaluate from 1 to b, right? Now, we like the negative exponent here for integrating. It, make, it made our life easier. We don't like negative exponents so much for taking limits. It's just nicer to see it without that. I'm going to pull this negative sign out because it's a multiplying constant of negative 1, right? And we all know that they come out of limits. Let's just get it out of our way. And so what do we have, right? Minus the limit as b goes to infinity. How do I rate x to the negative 1? 1 over x, good. Evaluate between what? 1 and b, yeah? So what do we have? Minus the limit as b goes to infinity of 1 over b, fundamental theorem of calculus. It's okay to plug b in, right? b is a real number, right? Infinity is not a real number. That's not okay. Um, minus 1 over 1, yeah? Okay, so what do we have? What does this do? We have minus... What is the limit as b goes to infinity of 1 over b? Constant over something getting huge. Goes to 0. Fantastic. So then I have another minus, right? Minus a minus is a plus. 1 over 1 is 1. You knew that already, right? That this amount of area underneath the green curve is 1 square unit, right? All righty. So this integral does what? It only does it converge, it converges to 1. The integral does. All right, back to our problem that was our original problem. Okay, now we want to talk about this guy, okay? 
does this help us understand anything about this sum? Well, let's just kind of see what would happen, okay? If we did the same thing and do left-hand sums, right, left-hand sums here, then we would get our series for the exact same reason, right? Because if we do a ring one sum, this is our delta x. Again, what is delta x? It's 1, right? Delta x is 1, yeah? Nice delta x, yeah. Okay, so if we do left-hand sums, we're golden in a way. You get exactly this sum, yes? 1 times 1 plus 1 fourth times 1 plus 1 ninth times 1, right? But the problem is, is that those guys are overestimates, right? Overestimates for this area. And we know this area converges, and when we know that this sum would big, be bigger than that area. And so if something converges, and then you know something else is bigger than that, can you say anything about whether it converges or diverges? It could be bigger finite or bigger infinite, yeah? Okay. So left hand sum isn't going to help us here. So what do you ought to, what do you think we ought to do? Good. Right hand sum. There we go. Awesome. Let's look at a right hand sum. So here we go. Go to the right end point and draw our rectangle. Yeah? Go to the right end point, draw our rectangle. Go to the right end point, draw our rectangle. Go to the right end point, draw our rectangle. Yes? Okay. Alright. So now what do we have there? Right? What we've got, if I do my right hand sum, okay, what is that right hand sum? Well, what is the height of this first blue rectangle? The height is one fourth. What is the width? It's one, right? So one times one fourth, right? What is the height of my next, what is the area of my next blue rectangle? The width is one, right? The height is one ninth, yeah? The next one? Yeah, that makes sense? Okay, and that will go on forever, right? That's my right hand sum. That is just 1 fourth plus 1 ninth plus 1 sixteenth, right? Plus 1 25th, on and on and on forever. Well, that's almost this sum, right? That's this part of the sum. That's the sum from n equals what to infinity? Good, n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over n squared, right? Here's the n equal 1 term, yeah? Okay? And so this piece is the sum n equals 2 to infinity of 1 over n squared. Okay, well this is the infinite part, right? So if this guy is finite, then adding 1 to it is also finite, right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay? So. It doesn't really matter that we're missing this first term as long as you have infinitely many terms. In fact, we could be missing, you know, 537 terms from the beginning. Sum of 537 terms is finite, period, right? And from 538 on, that's what matters as to whether, that's a really important concept, right? That's what matters as to whether our guy converges or diverges. We'll formalize that later. Um, so what, what can we say about this? This right-hand sum, you tell me, is that an underestimate or an overestimate for the area under our curve? Good. This guy is an underestimate for that green area, right? Because we're missing all of that stuff, yeah? We're missing all of these little corner pieces, yeah? Okay. So that's an underestimate. So therefore, this sum is now what? Good smaller than what the area under that curve, yeah? Okay? The area under the curve is bigger, right? Now, we know that that guy is 1, but we don't care so much. We'll talk about that in a sec. When this guy converges, that means it's finite, right? And if this is smaller than something that converges or is finite, then what do you know has to be true about this? Very nice. Also converges. Yeah? Because it's smaller than something finite. And then adding 1 is not going to change whether or not it stays finite, right? Therefore, this guy converges. 
that's the essence of the idea of the integral test. So we're going to want to state it more precisely, state it precisely, and try to figure out what about these problems um, allowed this argument and I comparison idea to work. Okay, what about these problems allowed this comparison idea to work? Sorry about the phone ringing again. Um, so that's something to think about. Okay, I'm getting ready to generalize this idea, right? That's what we do. We see something that works for a couple of instances, right? And then as mathematicians, what do we say? <gasps> can we generalize this idea? Yes, we can, right? Here we go. Oh my goodness. Let me turn this off. Stop. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, okay, back to this. All right, where are we now? Um, so, I know where we are. You're thinking about what features of these two problems allowed us to be able to make these conclusions. I'm going to erase the board and then we will continue. Okay, so it looks like we have something cool that will allow us to use something we already know how to do to do some to be able to say something about something harder. Final question for the problem we just erased. Did that sum 1 over n squared, did that equal 1? No, right? Good, right? Did not equal 1, okay? Um, from n equals 2 to infinity, right? Okay, just because the integral equaled 1 doesn't mean the sum equals that, right? So the sum n equals 2 to infinity of um, 1 over n squared, that piece we know is less than 1, but we don't know. Less than 1 equals 1. Anyway, um, that guy is not, the, the value of the integral is not telling us the value of the sum, right? Okay, um, Okay. so let's keep going. It is giving us a bound, though, on the max the sum could possibly be, right? And so that sum um, would be less than or equal to 2, because we had 1 plus the sum from n equals 2. All right, so let's write down um, the integral test. kind of seeing two applications of it, um, but now we want to write it down. So what was important about the um, things that we did? Well, first of all, we had a function. We created a function from the generating term of the series, and then uh, We, we integrated, right? So, just trying to decide what to write first. Um, okay, so let's um, consider a series of n, okay? We'll just say sum n equals 1 to infinity a n, okay? Um, let's consider that guy and then let, let and let um, f of x be such that f of n is a sub n, right? So we create the continuous guy from the, just like we just did in the previous example. So that's just saying it with math, right? Okay, um, so what has to be true about this function f? So if f satisfies So the first thing is we were integrating, right? And when we have our um, results about integrals, what's our hypothesis, right? In the fundamental theorem of calculus and all of that, like if f is what, then blah, right? Um, the first thing that we want about f is that we want f to be continuous, right? 
You already said it. F is, maybe I'll just say is instead of satisfies. If F is continuous on the interval one to infinity, right? That's kind of what we just did. We drew our nice curves on one to infinity. What else was true about those curves, right? Well, when we drew our x-axis, everything lived up here, right? What does that mean about f? If everything lives up here, f is good positive on one to infinity, right? We're only up here, okay? Nothing negative. What was the third thing that happened with both of those functions? Right. Decreasing. Very nice. You got it. So, if your function f is continuous, positive, and decreasing on 1 to infinity, right? Or, suppose you have a sum from like 5 to infinity. Well, then you just want from 5 to infinity, right? Um, then what? Well, then um, it's pretty awesome, right? Then basically the sum and the integral have the exact same behavior, right? Then uh, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n converges if and only if the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx converges, right? And then, I mean, we'll just state it just so we see it here. Equivalently, that means um, that the sum diverges if and only if the integral diverges. Right? The sum and the integral have the same behavior. That's the way to say it even shorter. The sum and the integral have the same behavior. If one converges, the other converges. If one com diverges, the other diverges. That's awesome. We're not going to prove this first because we'll get bogged down in the details and you'll like tune out. Right now we're going to um, do some more examples and, um, and then make sure we justify our hypotheses, right? So here's our hypotheses. We got three things to justify. Right before you can actually apply the integral test. We'll prove this in one of the other lectures. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, let's look at a problem that essentially encompasses all of the, both of the problems that we just did. Okay, so let's recall, maybe I'll switch to different color. So here we go. We're going to apply this guy. Recall from section 7.8 improper integrals, right? Okay, well, what did we have there? We had this improper integral that we said, you want to make sure you remember this. We drew a big box around it. We said, this is going to come back later, and this is going to be super important. Okay, so here it is. The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over, you guys tell me, x to the p. Good, right? The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p. And we, in fact, actually, um, we determined when it converged, when it diverged, and then we actually gave a value for what it evaluated to, right, okay, um, when it did converge. So, but for right now, what I mainly want us to recall, right, is that the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p does what, right? So this converges for, remember? P what? You sure? Okay. Good. Greater than 1. P greater than 1. And it diverges for 
could P less than or equal to one, right? Okay, oftentimes you think about P as being positive, but we even talked about the other part where P is negative, right? Or zero and said, you know, then you'd be flipping up there and it obviously would, um, we would diverge as well. So here's your result from integrating one to infinity, one over X to the P. That, in, that, oh, I forgot my DX. Maybe that's why you struggled with answering. <laughs> Um, anyway, the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx converges for p greater than 1, and it diverges for p less than or equal to 1, right? Um, we did the integral of 1 over x, right? That's the p equals 1 case earlier today, right? We, re we reviewed that guy, and we saw that that guy diverged, right? So this is an incredibly important result. And what does this theorem then tell us? It says, okay, well, then... Um, whenever this integral converges, then the corresponding series converges. And whenever this integral diverges, then the corresponding series diverges, right? Um, provided that our function f is continuous, positive, and decreasing, yeah? So what is the function f for this problem, okay? Um, so what is f of x? So if I have the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx, right? then what does that mean? f of x is, it's 1 over x to the p, right? Yeah? Okay, um, and then the questions are, is this function continuous on 1 to infinity, right? So we're, let's talk about continuity, right? So continuous, okay? Where is this guy discontinuous? Only when x is zero, right? That's the only bad thing that can happen for this domain, right? So it's continuous. Is it so? Is it continuous from one to infinity? Like, yes, right? So this is continuous. Maybe I'll just say it like this: continuous, um, continuous for x uh, not equal to zero. Therefore, it's continuous on 1 to infinity. So we passed that hurdle, right? Right? These are hurdles we got to get over before this result applies. Yeah? So that first hurdle is over. Second, is it positive? Well, it's positive for what? 1 is positive, right? This guy's going to be positive as long as x is positive, right? Since p can take on all kinds of different values, all right, this is positive for x positive, right? Which means it's positive on 1 to infinity, right? Yeah? Check. We, pa we passed that hurdle too. Third hurdle, is it decreasing? How are we going to check decreasing? is decreasing for um, so 
and this is decreasing. Yeah? And as we said, we really only care about P being positive anyway. Yeah? For our guys. Otherwise, divergence test is going to say it goes to, um, it, it diverges because your limit will not go to zero, right? Okay, and so we're golden, right? So let's take a look then at our series. We pass our three, um, we pass our three hurdles for the integral test, and therefore, what can we say? Well, we can say then that this sum, so what is our an at this time, right? 1 over x to the p, so we're putting an n where we see an a, so 1 over n to the p, right? Okay, converges, what does this tell us? For p greater than 1. And the sum, 1 over n to the p, does what? Diverges. For p less than or equal to 1, technically here, and greater than 0, right? But the divergence test would give us all the rest of them, right? If uh, p is 0, then we would have 1. The limit of 1 is not 0, therefore diverges. If p is negative, then we're up here, and n is positive, and so the limit uh, as n goes to infinity of a sub n, it's going to grow without bound, and therefore um, we can just simply state it like that, even though we had that. Does that make sense? Just easier to remember. But that's the use of the divergence theorem together with this. Alrighty then. us a new thing that we call P series. These guys are called P series. And this is our P test. You might think of it that way. Okay. So we immediately know, right? Oh, they probably have an example here that I purposely wanted to do. Oh. So we immediately know, uh, anytime we can put a series in these forms, so let's just do this one, the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over the square root of n, right? Cool. What is that? It's the sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the, good, 1 half power. What is this? This is a p-series. What is the value of p? p is 1 half, right? I encourage you again, every time you do these problems, to write this stuff out so that you don't forget what, how you're naming it and what the result is, right? p is a half, right? A half is less than or equal to 1, therefore it diverges, right? The series diverges from our p test right here. 1 over n to the p, p is less than or equal to 1, divergence. Yes? Does that make sense? Okay? So let's compare and contrast that right now before we do more um, integral test examples. Let's contrast that with our other results that we know, right? So let's compare, so let's don't confuse this. Don't confuse P series and geometric series.
right? What's a geometric series? A geometric series looks like sum n equals 1 to infinity of r to the k, right? r to the k, right? And this guy does what? This guy converges or what is it? Good. Minus 1, less than r, less than 1, right? And it diverges otherwise, right? So it diverges for the easiest way to say it is the absolute value of r greater than or equal to 1, right? Which is the same as r, r is less than or equal to negative 1, or r is greater than or equal to 1, right? And this is the same as the absolute value of r is less than 1, right? Okay? So make sure you are not confusing geometric series and P series. What do you need to pay attention to? Okay. In a P series, what is fixed? Good. P, the exponent, right? This guy is a fixed number. The test is based on that fixed number. This thing down here varies because N is changing, right? N is changing. One, two, three, four, right? The n varies. The exponent in a 1 over scenario, right, 1 over, that exponent is fixed, and that's what we're looking at for p-series. If that exponent is bigger than 1, then it converges. If it's smaller, less than or equal to 1, the p-series diverges. What about in geometric series? What's fixed? Whoops. That one doesn't make sense, right? Let's fix that. Good. The counter is n, right? Yeah? That would have meant something entirely different with a k there if my counter was n. Okay? It would only have meant the same thing with a k there if I had my counter as a k. Okay. So, um, what is fixed here? That was it. Correct. <laughs> what is fixed? Good. The base is fixed. Right? This guy, r, is fixed. And the convergence or divergence is based on whether r is between negative 1 and 1 or whether r is bigger than that or equal to negative 1 to 1. Right? Outside of, outside of negative 1 to 1. Okay? So here it's the exponent that varies, right? The exponent is changing. n equals 1, 2, 3, 4. So make sure you have those guys down. Right? Um, so here is a P series that diverges, right? And here is a you tell me. Good. Geometric series that converges, right? Okay. So I mean, or I could have written it this way, actually. It would have been even better to write it this way. I'd have. Right? Ooh. Okay. What is that? Well, that's the same as 1 half to the n, which has a fixed r, right? So this is r is 1 half. It's a geometric series. Maybe name it first. Name it first is better. I'm going to fall down the stairs here. Let's try not to do that. Geometric series. See if I can avoid that through the whole semester. We'll see. Uh, this is a geometric series, right? R is one half. The absolute value of one half is less than one. And so therefore it converges. Right? Two very different outcomes. Really why you cannot mix these guys up. Okay? All right. 
So we're going to do just a little bit more with the integral test. Um, and